Tony Russo. Lisa, there's no bigger decision that a football coach makes than who's going to be the next starting quarterback. And for Michigan State, will it be Peyton Thorne, who played superbly in his first start against Penn State a year ago, or will it be grad transfer from Temple, Anthony Russo? That decision won't be made until the fall, but it'll be great to take a look at him today. When you look at the two deep offense and defensive lines, plenty of talent, plenty of depth, and I'm guessing that Michigan State's offense and defensive line coaches want to say it's going to be the best O and D line they've had in years. Running back and wide receivers, another filled uh, with talent in, in both these meeting rooms. They will be a lot of fun to watch. Linebackers in secondary. Lease, I'm sorry, we're going to have to wait until the fall when they get <laughs> 10 new players to join the linebacker and the secondary group. That's okay, Jerry. That means we get a unique look at what a Michigan State and Mel Tucker run practice looks like. We'll take a quick timeout. ends are looking at Trenton Gillison, a redshirt junior, and really the most experienced player at the tight end position, Jerry. Yeah, and really the most talented guy. I, I mean, he started the first three games, and you know, missing the next three because of injury really kind of set him back. But you look at him body-wise, he's a perfect tight end. You know, tight ends in nowadays offenses are built like we're looking at Gillison. You know, he, he could line up at wide receiver sometimes at slot, sometimes. So he's really the, the guy that they want to play with. Tyler Hunt, who you see right next to him here in a bit is, is number 97. This is a crazy story, Lisa. As you know, he came as a walk-on, but he says, I was a street walk-on, meaning that they didn't even know that I was walking on. I wasn't a preferred walk-on. I came in off the street and asked to try out for the team, and he wound up being the punter in 2018. Here's his numbers as a punter. But he played at such a small high school, Goebbels High School in Michigan, that he had to do everything. He played some quarterback. He played a lot of different sports. And here, here's his stats from last year catching. So he actually started as a street walk-on, then was a starting punter. And for the last three games last year, he was a starting tight end. Give him a lot of credit. He's a really good athlete. I, I mean, yeah, absolutely. He, he, he I, I, could do almost anything, Mel says. I still remember offensive coordinator Jay Johnson said, you're going to tell me that a punter is going to try to play for me at tight end? He goes, I was confused until I, I, I saw Hunt take a few snaps, and, and then I understood. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And obviously, you saw some of his receiving numbers from last year. Got to work on the physical part of the game, um, you know, in terms of trying to grow into it, even with the run game as well. Zero receiving touchdowns for this group uh, last year as well. You know, Ted Gilmore trying to work with things um, in his second year as the tight ends coach. Now, we, we transition from the tight ends to the receivers. Courtney Hawkins, the former Michigan State great in charge of that position group. The top four receivers all return. Jalen Naylor, Jaden Reed, Trey Mosley, Ricky White as well. Uh, some of those players will not be available. They, you won't see them on the field here today, but, but certainly a lot of talent to work with if they can find the right quarterback to work with them. Yeah, I think Trey Mosley is probably the, the one receiver we will not see today, but but those four are talented. They have talent be, behind them. They have speed. I mean, again, Coach Tucker was talking about Jalen Naylor the other day. He says speedy. You know, I mean, that, 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 that should be his nickname, Speedy Naylor. Uh, Jaden Reed started all seven games. He had 33 catches. I watched him against Penn State. He's a talented, talented guy. And so, again, when you look at the depth on the offensive side of the ball, we've already looked at the offensive line. Tight ends a little bit thin. Running backs deep and and wide receiver is, is deep. So there's Reed, who's probably one of their better players on the entire team. Uh, maybe one of the better players in the Big Ten. And you see the number one there on his jersey. Actually, this is the first time that they broke out the number one since you remember Charles Rogers wore the, the number one at Michigan State and, and some other receiving greats, Andre Risen, Musin Muhammad, uh, a couple of the other number ones. But Jaden Reed now switching his numbers to one, number one. You'll see that in the fall. Yeah, I know. I wish I had known when I was watching last year's Penn State game. He was, he was, I can't remember if he was wearing. I think he was number five yeah, he was last wearing, year. He was wearing number five. You were watching the, you were watching no one what, because what, no one was wearing number one. No, but what I was saying was that uh, 
Coach Tucker's going to really miss this really good receiver, number five, because he wasn't on the roster. <laughs> but actually, it changed. Here, here they are here, uh, Lisa. Here's the top four. Again, you won't see Trey today, but, you know, from a, a, a re- wide receiver group, I mean, this is an impressive group. And, again, this offense, uh, tight ends, they've got to solve the tight end problem. They have to have a little bit more depth, as like we talked about. But w- there's no other issues on Michigan State's offense depth-wise. I mean, they – they got a bunch of winning groups, and this is one of them. And the good news from Mel Tucker, Jaden Reed is back. So just going from number five to, to number one. And, and Jerry, we have seen, and, and this might be unique and new for a lot of people to see this, you see the guardian caps on, on the helmets, and, and that will continue through the fall season. Explain sort of the reasoning behind that and how that's kind of changing the game a little bit. Well, it's keeping track of, of players when they're getting hit in the head. And, you know, there's been so much contra- uh, controversy and, and discussion about player safety. Nobody wants more player safety than than the coaches. And so this is a, a technology that, that helps the athletic training staff and the doctors and the coaches uh, uh, monitor head injuries and head contact. And it's, it's one of the great innovations in, in recent years in, in college football because it deals with the safety of the players. And there are considerations, too, about going into the fall practice, right? I know you talked about Mel Tucker with that, about how many contact drills, how many days you can go through that in the fall coming up. Right. And, you know, we learned a little bit about this during COVID, Lisa, where some of the, some of the coaches said you noticed the tackling is really poor because they had no preseason. There were less games. We didn't know if we were going to play because of COVID. And so... The coaches want to make the game safer. The, the administrators want to make the game safer. The NCAA wants to make it safer. So they're thinking about cutting the number of scrimmages back this fall. And the coaches are saying, yes, we understand, but we have to have enough live contact where when we go into a game, we can protect ourselves and tackle. And so they all have to come together, and, and they will no doubt come up with a good decision. You continue to watch Michigan State's spring practice again, going through so the, the per, uh, positional drills that you'll see here, and, and eventually we'll have like a little bit of a halftime, and then after the halftime, that's when we'll go on to some seven-on-seven seven and some nine-on-nine, nine as, as well as some full contact sort of scrimmaging as well. But you see the, the offense, there's, there's plenty of room for improvement for sure from 20. 20 to 2021 yeah there's no doubt and, and and coach tucker talks about he wants to be a physical team they practice physical we have to be able to run the ball and yet they're averaging less than less than 100 yards per game that's going to change and and this is unusual that this is his first spring practice and he's going into a second fall you know i i suggest to you that no head coach has ever taken over in more difficult circumstances than Mel Tucker. He gets there after the signing day. Spring practice is supposed to start on March 17th. On March 14th, it's canceled. On March 18th, COVID hits and, and they start closing down schools. He's following the winningest coach in the school history. He's following <laughs> Biggie Munn Hall of Fame All and Duffy Darby yeah. Hall of Fame. Uh, and, and he did have a spring practice. And so uh, this is a big spring practice for Coach Tucker. And... Uh, Missing last year's spring practice really put him in a disadvantage. Well, someone who is in the heart of that is our sideline analyst slash sideline reporter, Darian Harris. Give us some perspective. You know, you got you got a frontline view of all that in, in terms of the adjustments that this coaching staff had to make, Darian. Absolutely, and it's been awesome to have a full spring. Uh, you think back to last year not having a spring, not having summer training, not really even having a fall camp. Coach Tucker wasn't able to really ingratiate his culture, how he runs his practice, things like that with the team. So to be able to get all 15 practices in, to be able to get entire offseason with Coach Novak, I mean, the, the entire you know staff pretty much was overhauled. So new strength and conditioning, new nutrition, new way of practicing, moving practices from the afternoon to the morning. Everything was different for these guys. It's been great to see them compete this spring, and it's going to help us a lot going into the summer. And, Darren, you know, when, when I was talking about you at the beginning, that you're the director of player engagement, and so that means that you were within the conversations in particular about recruiting. I know I hopped on social media. You guys had to get creative. The, the recruits and prospects couldn't come to campus, so you had to bring campus to the recruits and the prospects. Explain how that kind of unique process went for you. Well, our on-campus team, led by Lisa Benchaim and, and uh, Scott Aligo, our director of player personnel, uh, everybody in recruiting, they did an unbelievable job with taking 
like you said, campus, not, you know, from here, from East Lansing, virtually to all the recruits across the country. So everything we did with our graphics and video department led by Blaze Watson, everything we did video-wise, graphics-wise, uh, you saw that was playing in the stadium before our practice started today, our virtual tour. We had to make sure that these recruits saw Michigan State and saw East Lansing as well as possible because they couldn't visit campus. And as we know, it's tough to make a college decision if you can't even see where you want to go to school. I mean, I, I feel for these recruits and the decisions they have to make with their family, uh, but we just wanted to make it as seamless and as easy as possible for them to see East Lansing to see Michigan State University. Hey, Darian, tell us about the morning practices. What do you think of that? I think it's awesome uh, because, as we know, it's it's being a student athlete. You know, student comes first. So for these guys to have an entire afternoon and evening to get schoolwork done, to have time to go to bed earlier, uh, to get an opportunity to eat better, to have, you know, social hours and socialize, that's what, you know, morning practice is. So uh, our ag academic staff led by Manny Chandler has done an unbelievable job of having to literally shift everybody's schedule from afternoon and evening classes to, to uh, excuse me, from morning classes to afternoon and evening classes and from morning tutorial to afternoon and evening tutorial to allow us to practice in the morning. But these guys, I mean, they get done by 1130 or noon and they're like, wow, I have I have the rest of my afternoon. I have the rest of my evening. I've never had that before. So it's been it's, it's been great. Uh, we're going to do it and continue to do it in the fall. And uh, again, that's Coach Turbin's philosophy right there. He was able to he was able to, to bring to Michigan State. Hey, Darren, with the lack of depth at linebacker, was there any conversations about you playing today? <laughs> <laughs> I told Coach Ellis, maybe I got a series for you, maybe two, but that's about it, man. I, my knees can't do it anymore. Uh, I you ain't got, got two, it anymore. You have two two good series in you. <laughs> two two-play series. We appreciate Darian kind of roaming the sidelines here for us as well. And just a, a unique uh, perspective from our perspective to be able to have someone on, on Mel Tucker's staff kind of give us that insight as, as we continue to watch Michigan State's spring practice. So we've kind of talked about all the different position groups here for the offense we're going to switch gears and go defensively as well you, you joked with Darian about trying to get some reps the linebacker spot or you know linebacker as you had mentioned the linebacker spot and secondary very very thin at that spot Jerry and, and one of the reasons why Mel Tucker went to this format he felt like this would be the most competitive visual for the fans kind of taking in Michigan State football at this point in the program right now yeah, and I, and I think Coach Tucker is really proud of the way they practice, meaning hard tempo. He never raises his voice unless it's positive. You know, there's a lot of things that I think he wants the fans to know. Here's you looking at the defensive line. Uh, Coach Ron Burton, this is his ninth year here. He's one of the best defensive line coaches coaches in general in the country. Uh, Drew Jordan is a transfer from Duke. I watched him on tape. I think he's really going to help them. Fletcher is what we call a tall drink of water. I mean, it's all in front of him. I mean, he is going to be a pass. Russia. Brandon Wright played running back last year and he he's going to be an edge rusher uh, the, the defensive coordinator said uh, Scott Hazleton said that dude can fly that's how he described uh, Brandon Wright so this is a team drill so we're seeing both sides of the ball but we can continue to focus on the defense Lisa oh yeah the defensive line you know we have talked about the, the thin aspect of the linebacking core and the secondary that is not the case for the, the, the entire defensive line we talked about the ends as well here are your tackles Naquan Jones of course off to the NFL and that's the big name that will not be seen and, and will not play in a, a Spartan uniform and and what are the guys you see the players to watch here tell me about some of your favorite here at the D-tackle spot. Well, Sl Jacob Slade is a returner. He's a he's a big-time, strong inside guy. I, I think a guy that the Spartan fans want to really follow is Jalen Hunt, nine, number 99. He's from Belleville, Michigan. It's a, in fact, it's one of my old hometowns when I coached at Eastern Michigan. And he, he is a big, strong guy who can really move. I think he's got a great future ahead of him. Mallory has played. You know, one thing about the defensive line nowadays, everyone's rotating. There you see a, a good look at Jalen Hunt. Uh, no one plays with just four anymore, Lisa, because of the spread offense. You know, some of the offenses are running 90 to 100 plays, and you can't just play four defensive linemen. So a lot of these defensive linemen year in and year out, you see Hanson, number 97, he's played quite a bit. Simeon Barrow, number eight right there, is, is one of the better young guys and has had a really good spring. 
Yeah, and, and don't forget, too, that, that Scotty Hazleton was bringing a new defensive scheme, and, and he kind of talked about there was three different installs. There was the Zoom install when, when sports shut down. There was the real season install in the fall, and now really the time in the spring, the spring install, where they have a time to kind of work with the defensive side. So that's on the front of the line. How about the linebackers? There's uh, there's four coming in, um, I believe, this summer, one freshman and, and three transfers, but certainly a unit that will miss. Antoine Simmons, of course, not only what he did on the field, but what he did off the field and the leadership capabilities that he had. So what does that mean? That means Noah Harvey, Chase Klein. Chase Klein you won't see on the field here today. They played significant snaps and will be expected to lead and play significant snaps again this year. Okay, the first thing is that it's a two-linebacker system, so they run a 4-2-5 defense. So there's four down linemen. You can see 35 and 37 of the two linebackers. Then there's a nickel player that ordinarily in a 4-3 would be the third linebacker. So the fact that there are only two linebackers helps them repair their depth. But when Antoine was out during, during the year, that's when, uh, that's when Chris Klein came in. And I, uh, Chase Klein, rather, I'm sorry. And I thought Chase Klein really looked good when he was in there. He's tough. He can run. And so it was him and Noah Harvey starting when Antoine Simmons came out of the game. But again, you, and you mentioned it, Lisa, they're going to get four new linebackers in the fall. Three of them are transfers. One's an incoming freshman. And think about it. We all make mistakes in recruiting, right? We recruit a guy, and he just doesn't turn out. But when you recruit a transfer... He better be part of the solution, and he better be ready to play. Otherwise, there was no reason to take it. Let's bring back in uh, Darian Harris if, if we can. And, and you mentioned he won't take any snaps here today, but he certainly has been in and around these linebackers. And, Darian, I want to ask you, there's a lot of, of focus now with Antoine Simmons out from Michigan State. The, the leadership for Noah Harvey is going to become so important. What have you seen from a guy like that? He's taking a, a big stride and a big step in the right direction in terms of leadership. I think he was able to watch the last couple years, whether it was Antoine Simmons or Joe Bocci the year before that, and just learn how to lead a team, how to lead a defense. Uh, as we know at the linebacker position, that's really your number one, uh, you know, your number one, you know, job is to lead, is to be the leader, to be the one that sets everyone up and, and makes all the calls. And he's done a great job of that this spring, really taking a lot of steps in the right direction to solidify himself as one of the top leaders on this football team. We talked about the defensive line. You heard us talking about the, the DNs and the D tackles. Anybody um, either minus Noah Harvey in the linebacking core or anyone on, on the front line there that has stood out to you defensively as you've been watching? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to get a guy like Drew Beasy back for a sixth year is just, it's, it's great for our football team. He was somebody that loves the game of football and thought he could have an opportunity to better himself coming back this year. I've loved the addition of Drew Jordan. He's somebody that's come in from day one. The first thing he told me when I met him was, I want to, how do, how do I get on the leadership council? How do I become a leader on this football team? So coming from Duke as a three year starter, the experience he's brought has been really great. And then Jalen Hunt, Jalen Hunt has been, has, a, has the, the moxie, he's got the ability, he, he's got what it takes to be one of the best to ever play on the defensive line at Michigan State, and I don't say that loosely. He's wearing that number 99 jersey that greats like Jarrell Worthy and Raekwon Williams have worn, and uh, he wears it loud, he wears it proud. He's a heck of an athlete up there on the defensive line, and I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do this year. Yeah, he's really got to shoulder that as well. Jalen Hunt, of course, and in, in a little bit, he got some starts over Naquan Jones um, in, in 2020, and, and Scotty Hazleton had said Jalen deserved that start. He was playing a little bit better at that point. Yeah, he started against Indiana, at least. In fact, he just saw Coach Burton whispering sweet nothings in his ear. <laughs> Is that what uh, that was? Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> but, but he's really a talent. You know, to, to go back to what Darian said about Drew Beasley, you know, he's one of the six super seniors on the team that they got an extra year of eligibility, decided to come back. Uh, he's been there so long that coach, they call him Coach Beasley. Okay, so the secondary is the next position group that we'll move over and talk about. And again, very thin. Shakur Brown, of course, five interceptions in seven games. That's a big name that this secondary here will miss as well. But we're talking about the uh, the cornerbacks and Kalen Gervin. And, 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 and when you're talking about quarterbacks, and you mentioned that this new system, so some of the secondary, they had to learn even the, the nickel spot maybe a little bit more um, last year than in years past. But again, the players to watch, you've got a few names there, Jerry. Yeah, and, I mean, look how many they lost. They lost five corners. I mean, that's a problem. Now, now you're right, Lisa. You know, it's corner safety and nickels. So some of these guys are interchangeable. But but they're going to need some help in the in the fall. 
they, they're not solid with their depth wise. I mean, obviously they have enough guys to to practice, but but they're looking for six newcomers coming in, three in high school and three transfers. And so, uh, again, when you take when you take a transfer, you're not expecting a player development. You're expecting a player. Uh, Harlan Barnett was on Coach D'Antonio's staff. He's back again. He's a, he was a great player at Michigan State. He's a beloved member of the community, uh, and he's back again coaching now. Uh, Xavier Henderson is a very physical player. Uh, he's an alley player. Uh, he's really good in the run game. Uh, Michael Dowell, I, I'm not sure we're going to see a lot of Michael today, um, but uh, they're a little thin. Again, it's safety. Kendall Brooks is a grad transfer from North Greenville University in South Carolina, and they're going to get a couple more uh, so that's Coach Barnett right there. Long yeah. history of Michigan State. Right. Now the, he's the secondary coach now, uh, technically. His 13th year overall at Michigan State. Now last year he was just the corners coach. Mike Tressel has left. He handled the safeties last year. That was the only real coaching spot that Mel Tucker had to fill from last year to this year. Mike Tressel, of course, moving on to be the defensive coordinator and linebackers coach for Luke Fickle and Cincinnati. But, you know, bringing in some of the, the, the Michigan State pedigree like a, a Harlan Barnett and and it was very important for Mel Tucker when he was first making his hires way back last February, I guess, over a year ago as well. And, and Harlan Barnett was one of his first hires. It was really important for him to get someone like that on his staff. Yeah, no doubt. I, I mean, it's just when you connect the previous staff that had so much success, again, Mark D'Antonio, the winningest coach in Michigan State's history, and Harlan Barnett, part of that staff, and all the players know him. I mean, there was maybe 5% that didn't know Harlan because they he, they weren't there when he was last at Michigan State. So he's a tremendous addition. He's a tremendous coach. He was defensive coordinator at Florida State. And it's uh, Michigan State's gain and Florida State's loss for sure. So that period is complete. And again, you'll see all these players and assistants, managers, equipment managers, they're going to run to the next drill in the next period as well. So the 2020 overall season, it was such a unique season as well because the two wins, well, they come against a Michigan team, your rival who was ranked, what, in the top 15 in the country at the time. And then you also knock off Northwestern, which also won the West Division title. And and I go back to that Rutgers-Michigan kind of the, the, the transfer that you had to make between week one and week two of that season I think few expected Michigan State to do what they did to Michigan in that that game here's what I remember about October 24th that Michigan looked unstoppable right Joe Milton quarterback they beat Minnesota they were ranked 13th in the country and Michigan State didn't look like they could get out of their own way against Rutgers and so nobody expected Michigan State to go into Ann Arbor and beat Michigan but but they did and, and again I think the players always get most of the credit, but give the coaching staff a lot of credit to get that team ready after a disappointing loss against Rutgers and to go into Ann Arbor and beat Michigan. This is a team drill now. So, again, Lisa, to the point about Coach Tucker, everyone's going full speed. Everybody's staying on their feet. Uh, there's no tackling. There's no bringing anybody to the ground until the second half of this practice. So, so this is a typical practice rep. It could be one on one. I, I can't really tell the groups, but but this is this is all live except for the tackle. And you, you should be able, if you're an offensive or defensive lineman, a linebacker, your technique should be no different in this drill than it would be in a game. We've got, uh, we, you know, Mel Tucker shared with us kind of the scripts here for this, this practice schedule with, with 12 reps being divided between the ones, the twos, and the threes, and the ones get kind of a, a second crack at this team drill as well. You see Peyton Thorne and, and doesn't have those uh, guardian caps on because the quarterbacks will be, of course, not live once we get to sort of quote-unquote live scrimmage competition a little bit later. Yeah, when you you know when you're when you're looking for a new starting quarterback, a coach is always making a decision: should I should I let the quarterback be tackled? And 99% of the time, you say no, and and that's the right thing, and that's what Coach Tucker does with his quarterbacks. In fact, Mark D'Antonio, I think, was the last coach that I remember that ever let his quarterback be tackled in practice when they were trying to find out who the new quarterback was. And the downside of that is sometimes they're not used to that rush when they get into the game. And and I thought Peyton Thorne last year 
uh, when he started against Penn State. Early in the game, Lisa, he looked like he was worried about the rush too much, and as the game progressed, his eyes went downfield and didn't worry so much about the rush. So we won't see any of these quarterbacks get hit today. Yeah, well, you see right now Thorne is, is running the offense. Darian Harris, I want to bring you in and just talking about when we get to the kind of like this team run versus the defense, the pace of play and just how kind of game-ready pace do these drills try to make it for these players? I was hoping we were going to touch on this uh, because it is – it is unbelievable just the speed in which we practice now. The, the, you talked about you know managers and trainers and everybody running. Coach Tucker is big on that. He wants fast managers, fast trainers, everybody moving, everybody getting to where they're supposed to go, NFL style. That's how we're going to be able to translate practice to the game when it's time. It, Coach had even told us, no walking on the field. Uh, we go from drill to dr drill. If you don't know where you're going to go, you just jog in place <laughs> until you until you figure it out. And, uh, yeah, as we said, equipment managers, that includes everyone. Equipment managers, so, athletic trainers, everyone. So, Darian, do the equipment managers and the athletic trainers, do they have an off-season program as well that they have to <laughs> go to? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We gave them a highlight reel, actually, last week of them in practice. So it is that serious. <laughs> You're not joking on that. I don't think he was joking on no, that. No, I think, yeah. I, I was, no, I, no, no, I'm 100% serious. No, I'm dead serious. We showed them a highlight reel of them in practice. You'll see, you'll see the position coaches following the ball. Watch after this play. You'll see Coach Piegler and, and Coach Cap and all the coaches follow the ball. Everybody's moving. Everybody's I, moving. I was the one joking about the managers and the trainers. But it's serious, huh? Oh, absolutely. Dead serious. The fast managers. That's how we select them, the students, and they do an unbelievable job. Uh, but but we tell them before. They got to they gotta know what's expected of them when they get into practice. They got to move from drill to drill. No ball is laying on the ground for more than two seconds. It's like tennis. We should actually show them a, a, a video of, you know, the tennis ball boys and ball girls and how they go and they run out in the court and they run across. That's how we want our managers to move. Okay, coaching the players, coaching the coaches, and coaching the managers. I love it. You know, I, I mentioned in our Zoom call with Mel Tucker, and, and immediately before he went in, he was so helpful and, and gracious with his time, and we appreciate it. But he immediately went into his practice philosophy. And, Jerry, you and I were, were sitting there, and he has very specific points that he said he actually reviewed in a, in a team meeting. He calls it practice culture. Everything from shirts tucked in to all the pads are in. You're not going to see any pads um, usually sticking out. With, with all these players, and it's the discipline behind the cones, behind the sticks, even no fighting or trash talking, talking about the defense not talking to the offense, the offense not talking to the defense, not talking to the officials, all about the team, team, team with him here even at practice. Yeah, there was a lot of things uh, that quite honestly, Lisa, coaches don't do nowadays. You know, and not that they're bad or they're good, but, you know, a lot about the equipment, you know, uh, he wants the knees covered. You can watch most college football games, a lot of knees aren't covered. Uh, so equipment, you know, obviously the, there's no fighting in practice and, and there's no talking to opponents. and you, you only celebrate with your team. You don't taunt and all that stuff. But uh, it was very interesting. He's very proud of it, I think. Uh, and it's a real important part of his program. And you can see it. I mean, we're watching it unfold now. I mean, everyone's running around. No one's screaming. But but there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of conversation. Yeah, and you kind of addressed it earlier. And Mel Tucker says, I raise my voice only in enthusiasm. And he was very direct about that. But he went probably uninterrupted for 20 minutes just talking to us about his practice culture. You you kind of brought up even just the, the mentors, the, the the people who he's kind of built things on. Barry Alvarez, of course, he was in the first recruiting class when he played at Wisconsin. He's learned under Nick Saban, Jim Tressel, Romeo Kamel, even, you know, some of the, the greats in the football world. And, and now you see we're at halftime here um, between all these players here from Michigan State. We will take a quick timeout as they are in a break here at practice. Still plenty more to talk about and to show you right around the corner. 
on this Saturday. The format a little bit different, as Jerry was alluding to. Not exactly kind of the game that we're accustomed to seeing here at Michigan State for the spring game. It's more of a spring practice. In fact, it is a spring practice. The first half, Jerry will go through some positional drills as well. And then the second half is the modified scrimmage, nine on nine, seven on seven. And then the, the full team first offense against the full team second defense. That's kind of what the fans are waiting to see. And time to send it down to the third member of our team, the former captain and former Michigan State linebacker, Darian Harris with Mel Tucker. Hey, uh, hey. Standing here with head coach Mel Tucker from Michigan State University in practice number 15 of his first spring. How did it feel to finally get an opportunity to get some spring practice out here? It felt great, man. We know, we know we needed to gain some ground in spring practice. We had 15 of them. We made the most of it. It's just great to get out this out here with these guys. Our coaching staff has done a great job. The president has done a great job. I'm really excited about this football team. First half of the practice is going to be more of a practice type of tempo with a lot of drills. Second half will be more scrimmage. What are you looking to see out of your guys today? I want to see the guys play fast. I want to, I want to see them play with technique and fundamentals. I want to play smarter. I want to play physical. Just, you know, play the game the way it's meant to be played. We got to get better today. Thank you, Coach. All right, thanks, Darian. We'll see you, buddy. Yes, sir. <laughs> Darian, thank you very much. We'll check in with him at several times throughout the day. Darian's actually on staff. Now for Bill Tucker, if you're not familiar with that, a director of player engagement. We told Coach he's got to be nice to Darian, and he proceeded to say, I'm actually going to have to be working for Darian at some point <laughs> in my life, probably. <laughs> Yeah, I can remember covering Darian when he was playing at Michigan State. I don't know that it means I'm getting old. I guess it does, but it means the network's getting old, too. We've and, been around a right, while. And covering Joshua Perry, right, at Ohio State. And now he, he gets a paycheck for the Big Ten Network as well. So, Jerry, you know, for the fans that really don't get a chance to watch practice, so we're going to focus on the offensive line here to start and kind of take us through it. What's the purpose of this drill or, or what we're watching here out of the gates? Well, they're working on pass protection now, so this is more of a group drill and individual you see they're being contested by the defense so they're just going through hurry up protections uh it's it's a good drill to work on your technique it, everyone is staying up and, and lisa we talked to mel tucker earlier this week and he made the point you know you have to be on your feet nobody should be on the ground unless there's a scrimmage and we're going to see that later on but this is just simulating some pass protections and going against the offensive defense the defensive lines making sure that they're in their rush lanes and the offensive lines making sure of their assignments and they're in good body position it's pretty fast-paced as well. You know, uh, we had a, a chance to Zoom with uh, Mel Tucker and gave us um, incredible information about his practice philosophy. And you even talked about it, Jerry, in terms of he uses the phrase, go live to the ground. And, and, and that's something that he tries to emphasize with his players. Yeah, there's no doubt. You know, you can practice all day. And if you don't scrimmage, Lisa, there shouldn't be a football player on the ground, right? I mean, if it's a tackle drill, obviously there's going to be somebody on the ground. The best teams in America, they practice every day or Tuesday and Wednesday, the two hard typical days during the fall with no one ever going on the ground. So you're going to see Michigan State, we're watching this drill now, no one will be on the ground until the second half of this game or this practice where they're actually going to scrimmage. There you see Russo, number 15, the grad transfer from, from, from Temple. Uh, the quarterbacks are rotating through. Mel wants an up-tempo practice. There's not a lot of standing around. Here they are. You, you know, I watched Peyton Thorne last year, and I studied him in the Penn State uh, game from last year, getting ready for today's broadcast. I thought his growth within that game was incredible. I watched Anthony Russo on two or three games at Temple. Uh, he has some talent. He threw 32 interceptions while he was at Temple. That's something he has to work on as far as where he puts the ball and when he throws the ball. And so they've got two talented quarterbacks. Thorne has a little bit more experience in this offense, obviously. But you look at Russo, he's played a lot of college football. You see Rocky Lombardi, who who was a, a starter for Michigan State last year, and he has since transferred, actually, when Anthony Russo um, decided to come to Michigan State. Now, Russo, of course, is the transfer from Temple. He's a grad transfer, and what's that mean? Well, that means that he only has one year here at Michigan State to try to make it work, and that starting position is not guaranteed to him in that one year. Yeah, and I love Mel Tucker's uh, statement he, he made. He says, just because someone transfers in doesn't mean they get a starting position and I, you know it's a risk bringing in a quarterback right I mean here 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 is Russo who has played for three offensive coordinators and three head different head coaches at Temple and now he's learning a new offense and then you've got Peyton Thorne who we're watching here and Lisa interesting what he said this week 
that the week he started against Penn State, it was so much different than when he had been a backup in the previous six games because that starting quarterback gets so many more reps than the second or third quarterback. Yeah, it's something that he definitely wasn't used to. Now, Peyton Thorne, you look at the body build. They're, they're built differently as well. Their skill set is a little bit different. Well, Peyton Thorne is listed at 6'2", 215. Anthony Russo, 6'4", 245. So he's about two inches shorter, about 30 pounds lighter, but running the ball is is something in his skill set that we would have to yet see with Russo. Am I right on that? Yes, you're exactly right. Peyton Thorne is the better runner. And, and when you line up in the spread, which 99% of college football is, is lining up in right now, if your quarterback isn't a running threat, he doesn't have to be an option quarterback, but if he's not a running threat, you're a lot easier to defend. So Peyton Thorne has a little bit of an advantage over Anthony Russo when it comes to the run game. I don't know that we'll see quarterback back run today but even though that Peyton Thorne is the smaller of the two he's the better and more physical runner Anthony Russo really didn't do a lot of the the option game at Temple and so that's the look at the offensive line and the quarterbacks here to start with this Michigan State practice we're going to transition over to the running backs and that in itself is also a, a really interesting situation I mean first of all you, you know kind of the ugly numbers and not pretty numbers for sure were uh, the 2020 rushing numbers for Michigan State zero rushing touchdowns for this group uh, Michigan State ranked of course 122nd out of 127 teams in terms of 90 about 91 yards per game on the ground you see William Piegler. He likes this group, though. You have Connor Hayward returning, Jordan Simmons. You have Elijah Collins, who a lot of people have thought he's starting to look like the Elijah Collins of two years ago. And then maybe the most key piece, you see number nine right there. He's the transfer from Wake Forest, Kenneth Walker III, and they are very high on him as a running back. Well, if they don't run the ball well this year, it's not because of the talent in the backfield. I mean, we're looking at Walker right now. I, again, I, I watched him on a bunch of Wake Forest tape. He he is dynamic. I will be shocked if he's not a big part of the mix this year. You, you're looking at Simmons. Simmons was the leading rusher last year, although he only started the one game. Connor Hayward was really the starter for six games. But, but this is a very talented group. It was interesting to listen to Elijah Collins this week, Lisa, as we listened to him. You know, COVID really set him back. And he had 988 yards in 2019. This past year, he had 90 yards and no touchdowns. It was great to hear him explain. He tested positive, so he was out for a while. Then it was contract tracing. And, you know, a lot of people are struggling with with COVID in our country, and a lot of young people have. And I think Elijah is an example of a guy who's trying to balance school, balance playing football, and then you add the COVID-19 mm -hmm. issue. It, it, it's an issue. So yeah. he, he's going to be back. Yeah, he, I can remember when he signed, Mark D'Antoni was so fired up. We were there on the bus tour. Elijah Collins will be back this year. Well, you mentioned the 2019 that he had, 13 All Big Ten. I loved what I loved the fact that he was open with the local media during the spring season. Because let's be honest, a lot of us following Michigan State football were kind of scratching our heads. And and I covered that opener against Michigan State and Rutgers. And when they said Connor Hayward was going to be the starter in the place of Elijah Collins, they talked about maybe the reason for that was his lack of physicality. I remember Jay Johnson saying, I, I worry about his pass protection, the physical aspect of it. Well, now you connect the dots right. because of his honesty and transparency of the battles that he had to go through with COVID and the contact tracing, like you had mentioned. That makes sense. He, he wasn't built for fall football at that point. Uh, no doubt. And, and let's give the Michigan State staff a lot of credit. You, you know, I, I believe that players should always be accessible to the media. I, don't, I think it's a great learning experience. But at a certain point, if the player isn't comfortable, yet they let, let them let them not have to interact with the media and then when Elijah came out this week it was great here you're looking at their numbers Connor Haywood I guess we haven't talked about we we certainly should I mean he was a starter a year ago he does everything right talk about pass protection he'll pass protect he'll run the ball he was really the workhorse a year ago yeah Lisa. absolutely and, and as you mentioned maybe the best uh, the best pass protector as well in that group Jordan Simmons I don't know fans if you will see him a whole lot here today you see number 22 he's there on the field of course but he's been dealing with some ailments this spring his weight has actually been down so in terms of when we get to the actual kind of scrimmage aspect of this practice I'm not sure how much of Jordan Simmons we will see here today